Well, I want to introduce today's guest. We've got a special guest. Ooh, special. Um, I'll go ahead and let you introduce yourself. This is sure. Eric Keller from Compliance One. And just, um, I guess, to start off with, just tell us a little bit about yourself, uh, how you got into the fire protection, life safety, um, you know, game, and what led you to where you're at right now. And, and also, you know, let us know what Compliance One does. What sure. exactly is your role with Compliance One? Yeah, I'll give you the whole kit and caboodle. All right. Once we're all. Um, so first off, thanks for having me on this inaugural inaugural podcast that's right yeah, the first one. this is the first one this so is the first it's gonna one. be the best one that's right there you go um so yeah from a life safety point perspective um so i started off in the world of construction management so okay. i originally went to school to do civil engineering started out mechanical and figured hey i don't want to sit in front of a computer for the rest of my life and just design stuff right right um so Went along the civil route, uh, ended up teaming up with a company um, out of Kalamazoo, Michigan that does solely construction management in um, the healthcare market segment. So I started off in that, um, started off in a hospital that was about 1.2 million square feet or so, um, just doing renovation projects and such. Um, so this is all new construction or renovations or Renovations, man. The bulk of it's from a renovation So you're doing a lot of ICRA, a lot of uh, ICRA, construction, ICRA, ICRA, ILSM. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, our role was relatively unique in the fact that um, we developed a lot of the ICRA policies and everything with the hospital themselves. So oh, we were nice. very involved um, at the forefront of developing that content. Okay. Um, so a little, little unique and got us exposed to, really, that was my first exposure from a life safety perspective, um, was understanding the construction ins and outs. And this was all healthcare specific? All healthcare specific. Okay, I mean, yeah. I branched off a little bit into the food and beverage world um, for a short spell there, um, just because that's where we had worked. That's where we traveled for a little while. Um, but all really revolved around um, keeping a facility operational while doing construction. So similar to hospitals do it, right. you know, I mean, they got to keep a line running in a, in a food plant as well. So exactly. you got to build containments, negative pressure, right. monetary pressure, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, yeah, that's really where I got the first start or taste, let's call it. Right. Um, the itch for it. Um, so, yeah, so as I went along, um, a, a couple of the gaps that I saw were I started to see maybe it was more gaps of myself, right, um, was the fact that, you know, this there's some pretty intricate stuff in regards to the things you have to do within a hospital type setting right um, and a lot of that is, is what you said the icra picra ilsm stuff so. yeah that's unique to specific to healthcare. i don't i'm not even yeah. sure i mean i'm sure there's some variation of ilsms because you're always going to have some kind of safety and fire risk but yeah to some degree but it's not what you have in a healthcare yeah, setting. yeah right? it's a so different I mean, dynamic not everybody's life is immediately in jeopardy if, if something goes awry right that's a good way to put it yeah so um yeah i kind of got my taste there and really want to start developing a little bit deeper into that realm. So how do I get a little bit better um, doing healthcare construction? So that's where I started to see, okay, so as we put these ILSMs in place, I got to really get exposed to the life safety code. Okay. So what are we doing? So we're shut shutting down half of the floor, right? I got to keep them operational from an elevator standpoint, my elevators in the construction zone. Um, I got to keep the second half of this floor fully operational while we're doing things. And I can't, I mean, we're gutting it. Right. right. Um, so how are people going to evacuate? Right. All right. How's the fire suppression system going to work? I've got, I got to take it down because we right. have to do um, complete guts and complete new layouts of the space. So, I mean, what well, happens when I shut down a sprinkler system for days? Right. What's the days, impact? Right. Yeah. So what's the impact on the rest of the facility? So that's where I really got the itch to go towards my CHC. So we got certified from an HCC perspective um, and then went for my CHC thereafter. That's the certified healthcare constructor. Certified healthcare constructor, yep. Yeah, that's a good um, one. Yep, so like I said, construction management was the basis. And then we started Compliance One in 2012. Okay. Yep, um, and that was birthed out of originally three companies. So the, the, the initial idea was it was a surveying company that did like mock surveys and a lot of ambulatory surgery centers. It was kind of the wheelhouse initially. Okay. Um, two was an architectural firm and then three was construction management with the grandiose idea of let's combine forces, right? And be the almighty one-stop shop. Makes sense. Sure. Yeah. Um, but which, what we found out was when we got there, yes, we could do life safety surveys. We can give you a, a wonderful list that detailed out here. You got to do this, this, and this. Um, but what you find is people have had the same construction team, the same architects for for years. Years, man. Yeah. And by all rights, I mean, they trust them. Right. 
So um, that kind of fizzled out as a, as a whole offering. Um, and just like what I was saying, we want to get stronger. I want to get stronger from a CHC to, to understand ILSM and all that stuff, just because I saw from a code perspective, we needed to know that stuff, right? And as we handed off these construction projects, I saw a gap or we saw a gap in the fact that facilities managers now had a huge task to take on. Right. Right. So, oh, definitely. I mean, their code perspective is much larger to keep a facility operational than it is me from a construction standpoint. So right. how can we help those guys further? Um, so that's how we started developing different offerings. Nice. So originally started with just mock surveys. How do we go in and help you guys assess what you really have at hand, right? So just like you're going to the doctor, you want to go in and it's, it's get an initial assessment, right? So you want to understand what's going on with you. Right. Two is, all right, so what's the prescription? How do we get better? Hmm. And then three is, what's my wellness plan from here on out? How do I stay healthy from here on out? Right. How do you maintain it? Right. So that's kind of how our services started to develop, right? So as we went and did the mock surveys, we found out there's, there's a couple different areas where other people need help. A lot of it was documentation. Oh yeah, so, I think documentation. There's a big gap in doc, proper documentation. Right. There's documentation, but it's not the right documentation. Sure. That's and, the part of the problem. Right. And what does it do? It sets the tone. Right. Right. So we saw a big gap there, um, and from our services perspective, I mean, we, we'll go all the way from, hey, let's take a look at your documentation, give you some feedback. You guys run with it. Right. All the way to, all right, we'll take all of your documentation. We'll produce new books. We'll produce put whatever into your CMMS system, however you want to tackle it, right? However, internal, it's specific to each hospital. True, right? yeah. So there's no cookie, their own, right. cookie cutter. Because in the end, our goal is to educate you enough to where you feel confident, right? Because I think that's the biggest gap. Yeah, one of my favorite sayings is uh, competence equals confidence. Beautiful. Yeah, I mean, I like if you know it. your stuff, you're going to be confident in what you do. Right. Do you guys do commissioning or did y'all do commissioning as part of this uh, kind of... Uh, turnover of the construction projects or uh, so is that no. a separate separate part yeah so we've got another company that we work with from a commissioning perspective so okay. if there is a need yes we can serve it so um, when we do a commissioning process we'll handle a lot of the life safety aspects so your fire alarm your fire suppression systems etc and then they'll take a look at your utility systems um, and then tag them give them risk assessments um, and then start developing their CMMS or their work order system with all the applicable information. You all need. the PMs that are going to be needed, all the yep. inspections. And yep. So those guys will traditionally take a look at, you know, what's, is there an alternate PM that needs to happen? Mm. Right. Um, life safety, you don't, you really don't have that option. I mean, the code dictates. It's what, pretty prescriptive. Right. What your PMs need to be. Right. Um, but if you have a boiler that you installed two years ago and from an efficiency standpoint, it makes sense that you can dial back your PMs. Great, as long as you have it documented. So those guys help a lot in that realm. So if there's ever a need from a utility and commissioning side of things, we normally leverage someone, an expert in that field. Okay. So. And so what's your role now today as far as, what's, what, what role do you play in this? Uh, you're the vice president yep. of, of the, it's Compliance One or is it a, a subsidiary of Compliance One or Compliance One? It's Compliance One. Yep. Okay. So we're, I guess, if you're talking subsidiary, so we're a subsidiary of CSM Group. Gotcha. Which is the construction management firm that solely owns Compliance okay. One. Yep. So Compliance One, from my perspective, so I started out, um, really when we started out, there was two of us, three of us. Um, there was a handful of us. Um, so I've done every job, right? So from door inspections to doing door reports to doing damper inspections to doing field verifications above ceilings, putting your head above ceilings for about a month. Yeah. Marking up drawings, doing reports, etc. Sounds about what we're doing right now. Right? Yeah, sounds <laughs> yeah. about where you guys yeah, are at. Kind of where we're at. Kind of wearing right. a little bit of every, all the hats right now. Yes. Yeah. So that's that's kind of where it started. You know, you had to wear every hat. You had to do every single job um, in order to get to that next point. Right. All right. Um, so a lot of the stuff that I handle now is uh, client relations. Um, so caring for our clients, we like to call it showing them a little love. Right. Definitely. Right. Yeah. yeah. So. Um, a lot of that's the, the basis of what I do. And then um, from behind the scenes, a lot of the financial aspects of, of the business in general. Gotcha. Um, the operations then, side. Yeah. So it's a, it's a lot of operations oriented um, as well. And then uh, just kind of helping from a scheduling coordination standpoint. So um, we have about eight to 10 people full time from Compliance One's aspect. Nice. And what is your reach? Is it national? Is it primarily i know you're, you're out of michigan yep is that primarily the market or i mean your market is probably national or how do y'all yeah so 
market is national, focus is local, right? Does that make sense? That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. yeah. So for us, as, a, as we look at it from a strategic standpoint, we want to own Michigan. Right. Right. And we want to own basically anything I can drive to from that aspect. Makes sense. Um, as we look three years down the road, right, we, we're starting to look out a little deeper. So what does that kind of look like for us? That for us is kind of a triangle between Michigan, Nashville, and St. Louis and kind of keeping ourselves within that specific region. So it's, so it's focused. I mean, we'll do stuff in Montana or California if they ask it. Right. Um, but there's some services, for example, door inspections, damper inspections. I can't honestly be competitive unless you have a local market to do so. Makes sense. Um, I just, I can't do it. So, so you said, you talked about fire doors. So yep. uh, fire doors, obviously the, the advent or the, the adoption of the 2016 uh, or 2012 rather edition of Life Safety Codes, what kind of drove the market for fire doors. And that happened yep. you know, almost three years ago. Sure. So what are you, what are you seeing on that? What kind of trends are you seeing on fire doors from your, I mean, now you're probably not in the field as much doing the actual inspections. What, what were some of your takeaways from the inspections as far as uh, common deficiencies that you were seeing? Sure. Uh, you guys do training as well? Yeah, so we okay. do, uh, it's called a demystifying fire door training. So what we saw um, the first couple of years, so this wasn't mandated before, right? Right, um, prior to, to the adoption, which was in 2016. No, no one was doing it. Pretty much. Uh, <laughs> and if they were, they weren't doing it right. Right. Yeah, it was kind of more of it latches, it passes. Yep. And if you have the labels on there, then it's good. It closes. Not, it closes. Exactly. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So that's kind of what we found, right? Right. Um, and we found a, a very significant fail rate. So from the 13 specific things that you have to check from a door inspection standpoint, um, some of the biggest ones were holes and frames. Um, and some of those holes and frames were as little as missing door views, right? Right. Simple fixes that could happen like that right um gapping issues is massive um the biggest aspect is if you had knockdown frames that were installed originally now they're starting to sag a little bit your door's starting to sway in a direction or another where your hinges are just kind of starting to give out you know just older buildings yeah where the building's yeah. settled and right. now you have greater than eighth of an inch or three sixteenths if it's a metal door so right right that's what we're seeing as well when we're yep. doing our inspections it's we're still seeing them but i think you're right is is when the adoption first came on board and we had they finally, a lot of these healthcare institutions had their first formal inspection is what I'll call it. Right. That's when you see a high high uh, failure rate. Yep. Because they weren't inspected to that same criteria, which yeah. is an NFPA 80. Yeah. Uh, so so you were seeing the same things. Then. Same thing, man. Yeah. What, uh, what do you guys see from a failure rate? I'll let you know mine. In a failure rate, uh, I think mo the gap still seems to be prevalent. Uh, you know, there's solutions out there now that are listed. I know one of the, the solutions that we're starting to push is the uh, NGP gap 90 solution. Are you familiar with that? I'll send that over to you. It's okay. it's a it's a it installs on the on the frame. Whatever if it's the hinge side, latch edge, or hinge edge, or the top edge, it actually installs onto that uh, onto the frame itself, and then uh, it allows that gap to be there because okay. it has intermissive built into it. Okay. So That's finally, cool. there's a product because otherwise before you ding them on the gaps and it's like what do you do to remedy it do you shim it you know and then <laughs> now you have a gap on the shim part right or do you have to replace the door yeah. you know and ultimately that's a high cost you know it could be cost prohibitive with right if you're, if you're you know finding that same uh, rate the other thing uh what, do you, what would you say alex uh other than that i would say um the gaps we're still we still find doors when we do inspections we, we inspect them also with you know one-on-one okay. so that kind of deviates from 80, but if we see, you know, a door that's 45 minutes and it's supposed to be 90 minutes, we'll tag that separately yep. as, you know, not being appropriately rated. Yep. I would say, well, we're not, I'm not seeing too many more painted labels. I still see labels missing here sure. and there. Yeah, every now and uh, then. Yeah, every now and then, but yeah. I would say the gaps is probably the primarily uh, the biggest issue. What, what are yeah. some of the biggest issues you were finding? Yeah, I'd say gaps, holes and frames, um, just doors getting beat. Yeah. Right. Um, but yeah, I think I think they've they've kind of got a little bit better of a handle on a, on a rating standpoint. I mean, uh, right off the rip, yeah, there was a lot of doors we were finding that were not labeled or underrated for the assembly that they had. Um, and a lot of the times, it's sometimes they need to just adjust their life safety drawings, right? Yeah. Because they haven't done it in a while, right? right. They, they change the use of a particular space, they change the occupancy, the office type, now, change, right? Right. Used and to be so stores, there's, used so to there's be, some yeah. significant savings that we found as we went along. Um, yes, you can fix these doors, but what's the proper way to do it? Right. Right. So let's take a look at your life safety drawings and let's talk a little bit deeper about how can we go farther to, to make this 
prohibitive for you, right, from a facility standpoint. If I can, if I have 400 doors now, and by adjusting my life safety drawings, I can take it down by, I don't know, I can sketch 100 off. Right. Right? Why wouldn't I? Yeah, it's a long-term savings as well, not to mention with the right. annual requirement. Yep. Yeah, you yeah. have to maintain those doors too. Because what we were finding from a, from a repair standpoint, and you, you guys can probably speak to this better than I from a, from a hardware standpoint, um, I was looking at it and taking worst case scenarios, we look at deficiency doors and you just say, hey, okay, I've got 100 doors that fail, right? We were chalking it up to about $1,500 to $2,000 a door from a repair standpoint. Right. That's just going super high based on we're, right. just, we're just talking, right? Right. I don't know what it is. I don't know if it's gap. I don't know if it's a hole. I don't, I don't know what it is, right? Right. So that's um, an average across the board. Right? right. So if you think about it, you take 100 doors off your list, man, you tally that by, I don't know, two grand a pop. I mean, that's, you, that's the money. Yeah. Right? Yeah, definitely. So that's that's one of the one of the things we do, too, from a life safety drawing standpoint, too. Um, that's one of our biggest offerings um, that we do as well. And a lot of the times it spawns off of um, door inspections, right? Right. To understand, that's that's a big point to where they figure out, okay, what do I really have? I've done 14 mini renovations over the last five years that I never really captured in any way, shape, or form because maybe they didn't have to be submitted to be a, or to the fire marshal office or, you know, I think things just happen that, that that were never captured. So we find a lot of that in the field too from a facility layout. What about from a fire stopping perspective? What, mm-hmm. what do you are you guys? Uh, I'll tell you what we're still finding. We're still finding a bunch of scab patches, oh, yeah. hot patches, oh, yeah. and we ran into some contractors who, who swear that that's a UL listed system. And, sure. You know, uh, it, we're still seeing that a lot. We're still we're still just seeing that we, we had a, a property we just did recently that was new construction and it was just bad. It was, yeah, it, was right. it was an ambulatory center, a surgical center, and okay. just unsealed penetrations using uh, you know joint compound sure. in lieu of a fire stop. Right. So we're we're still seeing a big gap in, in the education. I feel like on on the vendors and contractors on what proper fire stopping is. Sure. How to take it serious. Yeah. Uh, what are you seeing as far as on that side? Yeah, there's the oh, hot patches galore. Yeah. Um, yeah, and and some facilities have gotten to the point where they do a pretty good job from a above ceiling permit standpoint, um, but there's still area for improvement, right? Um, and a lot of the culprits are internal. IT guys that are that are running some different cables and that that yeah definitely are the biggest so. offenders I would say right yeah. Um, but yeah I, we still see a lot of hot patches a lot of improperly done penetrations and, and some of the guys just don't know All right what I think that's what right. mainly it comes down to because sometimes like yeah. maybe they just don't care but maybe they just don't know it's like yeah, it's probably a combination but I think it's more so they just don't know do they know which walls right. are even rated right. And then I think if people don't grasp the concept of a UL system or a listed system, sure. then you lost them right there because mm-hmm. if they don't understand that there's a certain applicability to this fire stop penetration, right? Then they're not. How would they know how to do it properly? Anyways, they're just gonna caulk and walk, you know. Yep. Yep. So, yeah, we're probably we're seems like, sounds like we're seeing the same things. Uh, dampers. Uh, what about dampers? Are you guys? Uh, you, obviously, y'all do dampers on. Are you doing four year or every six year? I know in, in the city of Houston, uh, city of Houston requires every four years, okay. even though there's an exception for six years in healthcare. Yep. Is that something you guys are running into, or you're, they're uh, allowing you to do the six year? Uh, uh, mostly six. So uh, there's six. a couple of facilities that do four, um, just because I think previous codes required four. Okay. If I'm not mistaken, um, and then they just kind of stuck with it. Hey, if I'm staying ahead of the loop, that's kind of where I want to sit from a standard standpoint. But no, I'd say the majority of ninety percent of them are around a six year cycle. And you're yeah. seeing uh, failure rates on those as well? Not nearly as significant. Um, Not as the fire doors because they've been on a frequency prior. But right, right, right. Yeah, so six years seems to be a long lag before it's inspected again. Right. I know in my in my experience, uh, mainly mechanical issues. Just, okay. You know, dampers not stroking all the way or, yep. you know, actuators going out, things yep. like that. Yeah, a lot of times it's actuators. I mean, we find some instances to where the, the door just doesn't close because it's getting logged up. For some reason, rhyme or reason, I don't know if it's dust or if it's whatever, just kind of got clogged in the track. It just doesn't cl- close as nicely as it once used to operate. Right. So, but yeah, I mean, from a failure rate standpoint, I mean, though we don't see a significant amount there. Um, I don't know if you guys do or not. But. Yeah, no. I mean, from my experience, uh, you know, there's just, there are mechanical failures more so than than anything else. Mm-hmm. Um, not so much programming on the fire smoke dampers. And what about, uh, of course, we got we got a training going on. You want to talk about that? Uh, we got Brad. What's the relationship with Brad Keys? I know 
yep. you know, as you as I've alluded, I, I refer to him as the GOAT. Yeah, you know, light safety, you yep. know, uh, being a former HVAP light safety surveyor. So obviously we're in day day one's wrapped up. We have day two day tomorrow two. for light safety. Yes. Are you guys going to offer more of those uh, light safety boot camps in 2020? Yeah. So that's something you just kind of got scheduled out or going to schedule out for 2020? Yeah, we're in the midst of scheduling out. Um, we're looking at a couple of different locations right now. Um, I don't have them pinned down at this point in time, but we'll probably do a handful, three or four or so um, in the year of 2020 um, that are kind of ones that we open up to the public, right? Okay. So we also do them privately for, for different healthcare facilities that just want to train their internal staff. Okay. So we do quite a few of those too. And just from a relationship standpoint, to circle back to the question that you had asked, um, from Brad and compliance one standpoint. So we've been um, chatting with Brad and working with Brad for quite a few years now. Like you said, he is one of the best in the business when it comes to life safety. Um, and we always want to make sure we're associating ourselves with those that are going to give a quality deliverable, right? Definitely. Um, so he, he's one of the best. He's one, he, so we pursued him um, and in April of 2019. Um, we acquired KeysLifeSafety.com, which is his website. And, um, so oh, much invaluable information oh, on there. I mean, oh, it's amazing, dude. Yeah, it just, you can just go back through the archives and just learn something just by reading all the questions and answers. So yeah, so I, so he all. started it about 10 years ago is when he originally started it. Oh, I don't know. Um, yeah, that yeah, so he, I, if, I'm, if I'm speaking correctly, he started it after um, Lori Green. Okay. Yeah, yeah, so she had one going. Yeah, he, she reached out to her and knows said, stuff in the yeah, indoor hardware side. You better believe it, man. Yeah. You got a question about doors. Yeah, she has a good podcast, or uh, rather a uh, website, I yep. Hardware. Yep, yeah, it's yeah, that's good. a good one. Yeah. Yeah, so I, he originally reached out to her and said, hey, I'm thinking about doing a blog as well. It's going to focus on NFPA 101, right? It's going to focus on life safety codes. So we started it 10 years ago and then just started putting amazing content out there. Yeah. Definitely. And yeah. I mean, there's like you said, it's an archive from here to kingdom come. Basically, any question or any issue that you are running into from a facility standpoint. It's probably been answered on there. Probably been asked yeah. and answered. Yeah. Um, and then Brad also... Um, continuously answers questions on a constant basis. So um, we, you can always email him at info at keyslifesafety.com as well to ask any life safety related question. Um, and he's always very diligent in regards to getting back. And then a lot of those Q and A's spawn into um, content that gets further developed um, and put on the website. And then there's also about 40 different useful templates and tools that are provided on that website. Oh yeah, well. not to mention that. Yeah, he's got yeah. a lot of good templates on there to use from yep. policies to Fire door inspector inventory, right. just ILSMs. I yep. mean, it's, it goes on and on. A lot of good content on there. Yeah. Um, so, and then we uh, do a lot of these boot camps, um, like we're like we're at today. Um, so, like we said, we we did a couple of them, handful of them in 2019, handful of them going to go in 2020. Um, and and really, the initiative is we want to educate, right? Um, so the, the basis behind this is we we want to make it so people feel comfortable when survey dates start coming around. And that's 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 a take fear. that anxiety out, and right? Then, yeah. yeah, everybody. It, a lot of people. Not that you're not going to have raised anxiety levels. Not that you're going to get a lot more worried about it. But um, we want to be able to to equip our clients and those facility managers to be able to to feel a little more comfortable in those situations. Definitely. Yeah. Okay. So. All right. Uh, I guess we'll go ahead and uh, close it out. I do have an open-ended question. Uh, what, what's your experience with? Um, IBC like versus the life safety code. Hmm. What I mean, because you got the construction background, so sure. I know that a lot of the the states and the sit local ASJs, everything's designed per IBC ISC. Yep. But yet these accreditation companies and CMS, you know, more specifically, because you know everyone's under the umbrella of CMS, you know, adopted the life safety code. What do you do you think in the future there could be some uh, synchronization of those codes or where? things could be more in line because I, I still see issues where it's like, well, you know, this is the way it was designed. IBC approves it, but then sure. life safety code says, well, that's not what we approve, but yep. it wasn't designed necessarily to life safety code. Yep. I mean, life safety code was involved a little bit and obviously the umbrella of those standards, the 72s, the 70s and 13s and, you know, 80s, but you got IBC that's the kind of the primary in ISC. What, yep. Just what's your take on that? Yeah, golly, I hope so. Yeah. To answer your question. Right. I hope they start diving a little bit. Um, they do to some extent, but there's there's a lot of different situations we see with new builds that um, as soon as the facility is handed over, now it's to um, NFPA, right? Um, so the IBC is 
I don't want to call it no longer applicable, but it's that's what it was built to, right? And then right. they're mandated by NFPA now once that facility actually has an occupancy standpoint. So right. we do see some discrepancies. Um, I hope in the future they do kind of get to that point. A lot of the time, a lot of the times, it's with how they're calling out certain walls. Right. Um, a lot of the terminologies, like you know, some of those things that they could be on the same page. So yeah, I mean, it's yeah. even dead end corridor distances. We had that not too long ago, a couple of weeks ago. Dampers is another one where. Yep. You know, the life safety code's a little more lenient on it, but then, yep. you know, you have to maintain them. So, yeah, I just thought that's interesting how that that's, that still becomes still an issue. Not a major issue because yep. for the most part, they are similar. Close. Very yeah. similar. Yeah. But it's still subtle differences. They can come back and bite you. Yeah, yeah. there's some glaring items that yeah. pop out that you'll find uh, every now and again that, yeah, I, I believe they're working towards kind of a unified front, but yeah. who knows if they'll get to that point. But. Right. Hopefully, yeah. You know, I mean, it's yeah, it's something you run into, and it, I mean, it's something we're starting to look at too from uh, an offering perspective. So we do a lot. We call it or coined it design with compliance in mind. So it's taking a look at from an NFPA standpoint. Yes, architects do a phenomenal job from an IBC standpoint, but are they looking at it from an NFPA standpoint? Right. I think a lot of them do. Right. Yeah, a lot of them do a fantastic job with it, but um, they're they're where they are really good at is from an IBC standpoint. Um, right. So it's taking a look at from a tabletop standpoint, before you send your drawings out from state approval or anybody to approve, let's take a look at it from an NFPA standpoint and see if maybe you are lacking in certain areas, right? So I like to call it the 110, 100 principle. Okay. So dollar for dollar if you catch it in design. Mm. It's about 10 times what it's gonna cost if you catch it when basically you're in the construction process, right? right. So you got studs up, you're starting to do things, you, you catch it now and it's like, oh man, now we gotta rip this out, now I gotta send this back, now I have a restocking Now fee, you get right? an RFI and get a change order, and right. yeah, all that stuff. But what happens now if you're, let's say you're at your occupancy walkthrough with uh, your life safety, your state life safety guy, right. and he catches something, right? Now it's 100 times what it would've cost if you would've caught it in design phase. Definitely. So it's, it's being proactive to set up your facilities team for success once you plan the building off for occupancy. Makes sense. Yeah. yeah. All right, man. Well, I think this about wraps us up. I uh, do appreciate you coming on the inaugural Life Safety Podcast. Love and, it, man. Uh, hope to put out more good content and just talk about life safety and, and help educate uh, folks out there. Appreciate it. All Thank right. you so much. Thank you. Right All right.